Good morning, Green Acres. It is good to be back with you. If y'all been glad already, already glad, already happy to be in the house of the Lord, let's give God a praise right now. Amen. Amen. I appreciate the worship so much. I appreciate the authenticity with which your, your music minister, Micah, ministers with worship every Sunday and every time I've been in here ever under his ministry, I've been blessed. I appreciate your pastor. And uh, he's away today, and uh, we know that, and so we're going we're gonna to have a good time making fun of him and poking at him and ribbing him. I prayed for him uh, really earnestly during his hysterectomy, and so just trust in God that uh, he's going to minister to him. But I just love, I love Brother John. I do. I love Brother John. Johnny is a, is a consistent encouragement in my life, and that's the truth. And, uh, and I know a lot of guys can say that, and, uh, and I just love him to death. He is just a blessing to me. And, uh, and Micah also has been an encouragement to me. And uh, I didn't realize we'd known each other that long, man. Yeah. I didn't even know you were that old. I thought you were like 18, 19 <laughs> years yeah. old. Then I look I at your... You okay, yeah, yeah, you knew that. You knew that. Grab your Bible or your iPad or your iPod or your Android or your Windows mobile device and turn to Psalm 119 this morning. Psalm 119. Have you ever wondered why God just doesn't just take us on to heaven the day we get saved. I mean, last time I checked, eternity is long and this life is short. Can I get an amen? amen? I mean, if you were to compare this life to eternity, you could take a speck of sand is larger in comparison to all of the sands, beaches of the seashores of the world than this life is compared to eternity. And I'm thinking, man, if we're going to be saved forever, why don't God just spare us and beam us up Star Trek style the day we get saved? Amen. Amen. I mean, that would be an awesome thing. But God leaves us here for a reason. God has a purpose for us to be left in this planet. God has a job description for every born-again child of God. Have you ever wondered... What that is. What is our purpose? What is the reason God extends our time in this earth before he takes us on to heaven? What is our job description? What are we left here to do? Our job description as a born-again child of God is one redeemed from sin, self, and Satan, and one uh, purposed for heaven for eternity. Our job description is to make God look good down here. We call it glorifying holy God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If there's anything the devil hates, it's the glory of God. If there's anything that the devil eats, drinks, sleeps, lives, and breathes to antagonize, it is the glory of God. If there's anything that Satan wanted to steal from God when he was kicked out of heaven, it was the glory of God. He wants glory for himself. He hates the glory of God. If there was a button he could push, if there was a lever he could pull that would de-glorify God, Satan would gladly do it. He hates the glory of God. He hates it more than a UGA fan hates Florida. He hates it more than Jim Crow hated blacks. He hates it more than you might even dislike your worst enemy. I'm telling you, if there's anything that the devil hates, it is the glory of God. He fights the glory of God. Now, Satan understands that he cannot directly steal the glory of God. He can't pop that balloon. He can't drain that tank. He can't push that button. He can't pull that proverbial lever. There's nothing he can do to steal the glory of God. God is solidified, cemented in his glory. You cannot do anything that God makes God less glorious. Can I get an Amen. And so, so what Satan wants to do is, he, he instead, since he can't directly steal the glory of God, he seeks to compromise the witness of his representatives in the earth. Y'all tracking this morning? See, our job is to glorify God. In the Westminster Confession of Faith, even in the Catechism, as they would train believers to believe right doctrine, the first question was always, what is the chief end of man? And the answer was always the same. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Our job is to glorify God. We are mirrors walking around designed to reflect the glory of God. 
And to the degree that we are biblical and right with God, we will more accurately reflect the glory of God in the earth. Satan wants to attack his representatives. What does he want to do? He wants to throw dirt on the glass. He wants to throw mud on the mirror. He wants to compromise you and compromise me so we won't fulfill our job description, so we won't make God look good down here. (laughs) So what he does is he attacks our personal integrity. He attacks our personal holiness. He attacks our personal degree of purity as the people of a pure, holy, and righteous God. So you got to understand that every temptation you face and every temptation I face is not primarily about me and my conscience, me and my testimony, me and my ministry. It is primarily about the Jesus that I represent. It is primarily about the God that I've been left here to glorify. He cannot directly steal the glory of God, so he wants to throw mud on the mirror that does just that. So what he wants to do is he wants to attack our purity. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a day in my lifetime where our purity has been more under attack. Our holiness has been more under attack. Our righteousness has been more under attack than it is. You can't even get your groceries out the aisle at the checkout line at the grocery store without your eyes being attacked by the magazine covers on each side. Am I telling the truth? You can't even take your family to the beach anymore lest the closer you get to the shoreline, the worse the billboards get. Am I telling the truth this morning? I'm telling you, I, don't even get me started on social media. I'm telling you, our purity is under attack. Our integrity is under attack. Our righteousness is under attack. Our Holiness is under attack. So the question comes to mind, how in the world do you maintain purity in an impure world? How do you maintain godliness in an ungodly world? How do you walk in righteousness in a world that hates righteousness? Well, I'm glad you asked the question. Because the question has been asked and answered in Psalm 119. David writes essentially this line in verse 9 of Psalm 119. How could a young man cleanse his way? Now that, that, that is not the best translation of that verse. The essence of it is better translated in the NIV and a couple of others where it basically says, how could a young man keep his way pure? How could a young man maintain his purity? How can he maintain his godliness in an ungodly world? He says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander. Oh, let me not stray from your commandments. Father God, I love you today, and I just want to thank you for the Word of God. I thank you for the worship of God. I thank you for everything we've already experienced in this room, and I pray that as we unfold this truth, it would, it would leap up off the page into our life. May we never be the same, and may we do well what you left us here to do well, and that is to bring you all the glory that is possible from our lives. You are a righteous God. You are a holy God. You are a just God. May we reflect you well. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, I always try to pray before I preach. One time this little girl came up to me after church. She said, Preacher Scott. I said, yes. She said, how come you always bow your head before you preach? I said, well, I'm always, I'm asking God to help me preach the message. She said, then why don't he? But, but anyway, we'll just, we'll just look at the, we'll just look at the text. So, so he asked the question in verse 9. He says, how can a young man keep his way pure? And, and, and he gives us two ways that we can maintain purity in an impure world. He gives us two keys to maintaining godliness in an ungodly world. He gives us two standards whereby we can maintain righteousness in a world that antagonizes daily righteousness. First of all, he says, by taking heed according to your word. Number one, number one, number one. If you and I are going to maintain godliness in an ungodly world, if we're going to walk in righteousness... In an unrighteous world, if we're going to maintain purity in an impure world, we got to make the Word of God our standard. He says, listen, he asked, he asked the question, how can you maintain purity in an impure world? And then he goes right in and names the plumb line. He names the standard. He names the measure of that which is pure. And he says, by taking heed according to, here it is, the Word of God. We say yes to that. We say amen to that. We nod to that. 
But I wonder how often we live that. I remember the first mission trip I ever went on. I was fresh out of high school, and we went to the country of Haiti. And we went down there to Haiti. And they warned us when we went. They said, this is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Man, I'm telling you, you're going to see poverty up close. People talk today about, man, Haiti's been really in bad shape since that earthquake. Let me tell you something. Haiti was in bad shape before that earthquake. Are you tracking? I'm telling you, it was bad. And I get down there, I see poverty. I'm talking about open sewers running through their streets. I'm talking about looking at a house, they'd call it a house, look more like a shack. It was about the size of that drum section right there. There'd be five families that'd live in that shack, and they'd take shifts sleeping so they'd have somewhere to live. If they did find food today, they wouldn't eat it for themselves. They'd give it to their kids, and that's why so many of the kids did better than the parents when it came to nutrition. I'm telling you, it was unbelievable poverty. We had some life-changing experiences there. Well, we were working at the missionary compound, and they challenged us because most of the time you go on a mission trip like this, you're going to build something. And so we were building this wall. We were trying to finish this wall around the ministry compound, and they set a goal for us, and they said, listen, if you get to this length by the end of the week, we're going to reward you guys by taking you swimming in a swimming pool. Now, I'm going to tell you, that was like a big announcement in Haiti. Because if there's anything we had not seen since we'd been there over a week already, it was a swimming pool. (laughs) Matter of fact, Haitians, they bathe and take a bath and wash their clothes and dump their trash all in the same river, all right? And they're telling us we're going to a swimming pool. Well, it turns out they'd found this uh, French hotel on the side of this beautiful picturesque mountain that was about a 45-minute drive away from the city where we were. And there was a big gate and iron uh, uh, fence around this hotel, and they gained permission for our missionary team to go swimming in the pool at that hotel for the afternoon at the end of the week if we did our job and met our goal. And so we believed them, and, and we looked forward to that, and so we worked really hard all week, met our goal. So, so at the end of the week, all 38 of us ju- jumped on the back of an Isuzu pickup truck <laughs> and, uh, and, and went 45 minutes up the side of a Haitian mountain and saw this hotel. I remember coming around the corner, man, it was absolutely picturesque. It was like something off a postcard. Man, this French chalet looking hotel that sprawled out, this big old iron gate with guards in front and they opened it up. Our Zuzu pickup truck went inside there. We were scanning for the pool already, man. It was only about 132 degrees in Haiti all week long. Humidity off the chart. Man, I'm telling you, we were so ready to go swimming in some kind of swimming pool. We surveyed the landscape There it was. Man, I'm telling you, it too was like something off a postcard. I'm talking about palm trees were swaying in the breeze. I'm talking about lounge chairs placed just right. Manicured grass surrounding this cement pond. I'm talking about swimming pool, honest to God. Man, we jumped off the back of that pickup truck, and we were wondering who's going to be the first to get in. Man, the guys were beating the girls because there is a difference between the genders. And, And all of a sudden, man, I'm telling you, they were throwing down our towels. We're throwing down our suntan lotion, and who's going to be the first? Well, Andy was always the first among us. He got to the edge of the pool. I'm watching him. I'm right behind him. I got about 15 behind me, and he's about ready to jump in. He says, Urk! And about eight of us got to the edge, and then about eight more got to the edge, and the next thing you know, we're all surrounding the pool, looking in that pool. It's a good thing Andy didn't jump. You know why? Oh, yeah, there was water in the pool, if that's what it's really called. Oh, yeah, the pool was about half full. Therefore, it was also half empty. And I failed physics. Can you believe that? And I'm telling you, it's a wonder we didn't smell the pool before we got to the pool. The water was anything but clear. I mean, you could not see the bottom. Stuff was floating on the top. Even the water had been clear. You could not see the bottom. I'm standing there in stark silence with every other guy and every other girl standing around that pool. Oh, my gosh. And I'm thinking, you know what I'm thinking? I'm, I'm thinking about them rats I've been seeing in Haiti ever since I got to Haiti, swimming in that pool. They got rats this big in Haiti. No, I'm talking, honey, without the tail. I mean, rats this big. You think I'm kidding. I'm talking about, you don't go deer hunting in Haiti. You go rat hunting in Haiti. They got 10-point rat in Haiti. You hit a rat in the road, it'll blow up your truck, man. I'm telling you, Unbelievable. And so, so I'm thinking, man, them rats been having a pool party at night when nobody's around. They just don't tell them what's in that pool. Now, I'm going to make a long story real short. We went swimming about 10 minutes after that. But in order to do so, we had to do some mental gymnastics to ease our conscience so we could have a jolly good time. We began to think among ourselves. Now, wait a minute. 
We're not in America. We're in Haiti. There's a reason there's a fence and a gate around this hotel. Oh, the common Haitian folk aren't allowed to come in here and swim in this pool. Because by Haitian standards, this is a clean pool. By Haitian standards, this is the best the country's got. By Haitian standards, this is about as good as it gets. And when we begin to suspend our American standard of purity and adapt to the standard of our environment, we could ease our conscience and go swimming in the pool. Y'all tracking where I'm going? Folks, I'm telling you, there's a lot of times that we sit in a pew on Sunday and the preacher lifts up the standard of the Word of God, but we walk out the exit, past the exit sign and we begin to look at the culture and we begin to adapt to a different standard. We say, well, we're not in heaven yet and at least I ain't doing what they're doing and at least I'm not doing what she's doing and at least I'm not doing what they're doing. We begin to suspend our godly standard of what is right and wrong. We begin to suspend our ultimate standard of purity of the Word of God and we begin to adapt to the standard of our environment so we can ease our conscience but but we're still swimming in the cesspool of a dying culture that hates God. Friend, listen, we have begun to begin at ease with things that would make our great godly grandparents roll over in their grave. In the 1950s, America said, I know what's right and I know what's wrong. In the 1960s, America said, I know what's right and I know what's wrong, but I don't care. In the 1980s, uh, 70s, America said, I know what's right and I know what's wrong, but nobody cares. In the 1980s, America said, I don't know what's right and I don't know what's wrong. In the 1990s, America said, there is no right and there is no wrong. And since the century turned to a new one, we've been making it up as we go. We've rejected God and every man does what is right in his own eyes. I want to announce to you today that there is still a God in heaven. There is still a word that has not changed. The standard has not moved. God has not changed his character and God has not changed his mind. And what was right when this Bible was written is still right today. And what was wrong when this book was written is still wrong today. What would harm you when this book was written will still harm you today. And what will bless your life when this book was written will still bless your life today. You've got to make up your mind if you're going to glorify God that his standard is the only one that matters even if the culture goes to hell without us. Amen. Amen. Listen, Satan doesn't care that you're in church this morning. I'll be honest with you. Satan goes to church more than we do. Satan goes to church more than we do. Do you understand that everything you're, every time your pastor stands up here and preaches, and by the way, if there's any Bible-believing, Bible-preaching pastor in Georgia, it's Johnny Elson. And by the way, they're a dying breed. Because everybody wants to scratch itching ears nowadays. Every time your pastor stands up here and preaches the Word of God, the Bible says that every time that seed is scattered, that the devil sits like a bird in the rafters waiting to swoop down and steal that seed before it takes root and bears fruit in your heart. That's why most Baptists sitting in pews on Sunday don't even take notes at all. And 85% of what we hear, we forget within 24 hours. That makes the devil's day. That'll bless a preacher's heart. No, man, man, some want to quit sometime, give up, but that'll bless the devil's heart all day long. Friend, I'm telling you, the devil goes to church more than you do. That's why the Bible says, don't be, merely be a hearer of the word, but be a... Mm. Listen, hearing the Word of God does not make hell back up. Hearing the Word of God does not make the devil shake in his boots. Hearing the Word of God does not make the demons assigned to you nervous. Hearing the Word of God is one thing, but you want to make hell nervous? You want to make the devils try to figure out another plan? You want to make them nervous when your feet hit the far, uh, floor in the morning? You decide you're not just going to hear it. You're not just going to take notes on it. You're not just going to amen it. You're not just going to give a nod to it. You're not just going to intellectually believe it. You are going to walk in the Word, live in the Word. Word, fight with the Word, stand on the Word, and let the Word be your standard. I'm telling you, Satan can't hang with that. Amen. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says in Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of God dwell in you richly. You got to let the Word. It's one thing to know the Word. It's another thing to let the Word. It's one thing to hear the Word. It's another thing to let the Word. It's like one preacher said, our problem is we have been educated beyond our level of obedience. Jesus said, two men built a house. Didn't he say that? Two men built a house. One man built his house on the rock. The other man built his house on the... Two men built his house on the rock. The other man built his house on the... 
All of a sudden, storms began to beat against the walls of both houses. Rains fell on the roofs of both houses. Flood waters surrounded the base of both houses. And when the storm clouds cleared, only one house still st stood. The one standing was the man that built his house on the... Now, the disciples go up to Jesus and say, Jesus, we really need to know the interpretation of that story. I mean, you finish the story, you drop the mic, and you walk out the room. I got to know who is the wise man. Who is the dumb man? I don't want to be the dumb man. I want to be the wise man. Who is the wise man that built his house on the rock? And Jesus answered him, he who hears these words of mine. Well, we're doing good so far. <laughs> Amen. He who hears these words of mine. Okay, Jesus. Preach the sermon, give me the Bible study, read the devotion, bring it on. Nope, that's not enough. Jesus said, he who hears these words of mine and, he who hears these words of mine and, he who hears these words of mine and, puts them into practice. Don't just be a hearer of the word, be doers also. Uh, the scientists, psychologists tell us that when you go buy a book at the bookstore, that it releases the same amount of dopamine, the reward center of the brain, for buying the book as it does when you read it. <laughs> so you know why a lot of people buy the book? Some of you sitting in here this morning. You buy the book, but you never pick it up after that. You buy the book, but it's still sitting on your shelf. You buy another book before you even read the last book, and you still haven't read the book you just bought to read that book. You buy the book, you get the same dopamine scored in your brain saying you did a good job as you do when you sit down and read it. Friends, sometimes we're doing the same with the Word of God. We get a good feeling when we hear it. We get a good feeling when He preaches. We get a good feeling when the devotion comes. We get a good feeling in Sunday school. But I'm going to tell you, the good feeling ain't the feeling you get when you stand on the Word of God in the face of the battle and you come out victorious. When you stand in the face of temptation and you quote the book and you come out on the other side. When you stand under satanic attack and you say, I'm going to stand in the word of God and you quote the word of God and you come out on the other side of the battle. Yes, you're bloody. Yes, you're bleeding. But you won. Why? Because you took the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, your offensive weapon, and you used it for what it was to be used for. It is your standard. Amen. My mama's not the standard of my purity. My preacher's not the standard of my purity. My wife is not the standard of my purity. And the only authority they have is the authority they have when they quote me, point me to the standard that holds all of us accountable, but not as uh, just within us, but as over, above, and around us is our authority, the Word of God. The Word of God. So what does that mean? That means the Word of God's got to be allowed to address your purity. Psalm 101, 3, I will set no unclean thing before my eyes. The deeds of faithless men I hate, I will not let them cling to me. I will set no unclean thing before my eyes. The deeds of faithless men I hate, I will not let them cling to me. I will set no unclean thing before my eyes. What would happen to your television watching? What would happen to your internet surfing if you took that verse, put it on a three by five card, and taped it to your monitor, and taped it to your set television set? I will set no unclean thing before my eyes. The deeds of faithless men I hate, I will not let them cling to me. What happens if the word of God becomes the standard of what you will or will not look at, then the 71% of church-going men that are addicted to pornography and the 55% of pastors that are addicted to pornography, that number would go down because the standard no longer would be the culture or what I can get away with or what my wife hadn't found out about yet. It'll be the unchanging, all-present, all-powerful Word of God. <laughs> Word of God. What if you took a verse like Ephesians 4, 29? Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Or how we say it, come out your mouth. But only that which is good and will administer grace to the hearers. What if you could take that verse to the mirror as you sit in the salon chair? And that conversation inevitably turns to gossip. But the Word of God has become the standard that addresses what will or will not come out of your mouth. What happens on a date? When you go out on a date and you print out your sign and you tape it to the dashboard, a verse like, like, like 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, verse 3 that says, flee sexual immorality. Make no provision for the flesh. 
What happens when you let the Word of God address the standard for your sexuality on a date? What will or will not happen? Man, I'm telling you what would do a lot of guys good is next time you go on a date for the first time with some girl, just let her know where you stand. Just take that family Bible, that big old honking mama jamma family Bible that weighs 122 pounds, that sits on your mama's dresser, that don't nobody ever open because it's a family heirloom. Just put it right there between you in the car. <laughs> And then she's got to go through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to get over there to you. Amen. <laughs> what are you saying, Scott? I'm saying, listen to me. How do you maintain godliness in an ungodly world? You've got to make the word of God your standard, whether it's in season or whether it's out of season, whether it's popular, whether it's unpopular, whether they outlaw it or whether they inlaw it. Friend, I'm telling you, the word of God is our only standard, period. Is it yours? Or is it your feelings? Or is it Bubba? Or is it family? Or is it what he says or she says or they do or where we are? The Word of God's got to be our standard. I've said way too much. I actually have a second point I've got to preach now. It's, number one, the Word of God must be your standard if you're going to maintain godliness in an ungodly world. But number two, not only must the Word of God be your standard, but the God of the Word must be your passion. The God of the Word must be your passion. Verse 10, with my whole heart, I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your command. With my whole heart, with my whole heart, I sought you. I remember in my house growing up, Saturdays was big house cleaning day. Saturdays was the day mama put a vacuum cleaner in our hands or a dust rag in our hands or garbage can in our hands. And we did chores on Saturday. Can I get a witness in the house? Saturday was the day. And so, so now while house cleaning was a big priority for mama, Bugs Bunny was a big priority for me. I mean, loony were the tunes. There was Yosemite Sam and Daffy Duck. I mean, I got places to be, mama. So what happened is she, she'd been up since, you know, 6 a.m. on Saturday. I'd roll out of bed about 9 o'clock. I'd sneak past the kitchen where she normally was. I'd go into the den, and I'd cut on my Looney Tunes. Sooner or later, mama would hear the TV on. She would walk into the room. She got old jeans on. She got old, that same old sweatshirt, faded letters. A dripping yellow glove on each hand. And she'd look at me, and then she'd push her glasses up like this. You ever seen this? <laughs> and then out of her oral cavity would come the list, the list of chores and tasks and commands that I was to carry out throughout the afternoon. They would sail through the air. They would find their way upon my noggin, whereupon they would immediately bounce off. Why? Because it's too late. I'm locked. It's too late. In front of me is Bugs Bunny. In front of me is Wild E. Coyote. In front of me is Yosemite Sam. And when I'm watching Looney Tunes, nothing else exists. I have what you call a one-track mind. I was born in the 70s, man. It's a wonder I don't have an eight-track mind. But anyway. <laughs> Some of these kids are like going, what's that? It wasn't a CD, I promise you that. And then some other kids just went, what's that? <laughs> CD. Hey, listen, my, drives my wife crazy to this day. If I'm looking at something, if I'm reading something, listen, there ain't but so many brain cells in this noggin, and they can only focus on so much at one time. Are you with me? I'm also known as a male, okay? I've got a, I, it's just, I, can't, I can't zone in. Listen, here's what David said. He said, listen, i got a one-track mind. Yes, I am a king, and i got servants, but my servants are not my distraction. Yes, I'm a king. i got great possessions, but my possessions are not my distraction. Yes, I'm a king. i got status, but I ain't after more status. When I wake up in the morning, i got a one-track mind upon my bed. I meditate on you, O Lord. You are my heart's desire, amen, with my whole heart. I've sought you, and I'm telling you, when you seek God with your whole heart, he promises he will be found by you. Jeremiah chapter 12. He says, or 29 verse 12, he says, if you seek for me, you will find me. But he puts a condition on it. If 
you search for me with all your heart. I remember the first grandchild that came into the family was not my child. It was my nephew, Blaine. Blaine is now 20 years old, married, fine, upstanding young man. He was the first grandchild in the family. And I remember I would go into the area of preach revival, and when I was in that area of preaching revival, we'd usually stay at my mama's house, and she was the primary babysitter for Blaine. And I remember that little age that they get. I don't know, they're about two years old, maybe three. There's an age and stage that they get at where, where, where they, they can walk and stuff, but they can't talk yet. You know what I'm talking about? And they can even understand a lot of words you say, but they can't talk themselves yet. And, and so it's, it's, that, it's that stage, and that's, that was Blaine. He just always around the house, no shirt on, no shoes on, diaper hanging on off half full I mean here's old Blaine he just all the way around the house he can't talk he just bad 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 but he can understand some stuff because I know he could because when I'd say I'm gonna get you I'm gonna get you I'm gonna get you he'd do this <laughs> no matter where I was in the house I'm gonna get you I'm gonna get you he started now here, here here's the thing I learned about grandparents in the house was the grandparents mama and papa Grandma and Papa. And, and, and I'm going to tell you something. My, 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 my stepdad, his Papa, is always very busy. He's got stuff in his hands. He's working on things. He's, he's always very active. But I'm going to tell you something. I found that when I said, Blaine, Uncle Scott, go and get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. And, and, and my, my stepdad, Papa, when he saw this, Brother, it didn't matter. Listen, here's where Blaine's, Blaine's always going for Papa. It doesn't matter where Papa is. He's going to for Papa. He's fine. He, I, I, sometime, man, he's like got Papa radar, right? I mean, it's like he knows where Papa. One time, like, Papa's out there on the lawnmower. I'm in the house. There's Blaine. Oh, I got you now. <laughs> Ain't no Papa around. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. But, man, he's got, like, Papa radar. He knows Papa. He's breaking through walls. <laughs> And I'm telling you, no matter how busy Papa was, no matter how ha full his hands were, no matter where his attention was before that, when he saw this, when he saw this, he would stop the lawnmower, he would put down what's in his hands, he would get down away from the tools, he would walk out, whatever he would do, and he'd say, come on, Blaine, come on, son, come on. And he'd always bring him up and hold him close and protect him from boogeyman Scott. <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you, I saw that scene over and over and over, and Blaine learned growing up he could always count on Papa to be there for him no matter what he was doing. He turns his attention whenever he saw this. I'm telling you, God is 10,000 times better than any granddaddy on the planet. God is 10 million times better than any daddy on the planet. And when he looks at one of his children doing this, seeking him with all their heart, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter how busy God seems. It doesn't matter how preoccupied God seems. It doesn't matter how absent God's been seeming to you lately. I'm telling you, he will be found by you. He he will scoop you up. He will hold you close and he'll renew your heart to his every single time. That's a promise. Do you understand God is looking for this from us? David says, with my whole heart, not some of it. With my whole heart, not most of it. With my whole heart. I got all this stuff. I got a kingdom to run. I got temptations galore. I done lost half the battle, David said, but that's fine. Because at the end of it all, with my whole heart. Now, 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 last time I checked, you can't seek God with a whole heart. If you're not guarding that heart. See, 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 there's something called the rights of access law. The rights of access law says that if I own a hundred acres, or if you own a hundred acres, and I buy a half an acre in the middle of the hundred acres, then by law, you've got to give me access to walk on part of your hundred acres to get to the half acre I own in the middle. By law, you've got to allow me to tread on the land that I do not own to get to the land that I own. Satan doesn't want the whole hundred acres. He'll take half an acre in the middle. Because he understands that if he can get just part of your heart, he can trample the rest of it underneath his feet. Sooner or later, he'll get the rest of the rooms in the house. Sooner or later, he'll get the rest of the testimony for Jesus. Sooner or later, he'll get the rest of the conscience that ain't tainted yet. If you just give him half an acre, he'll walk on the rest to get to that which he owns. Are you tracking? 
Rights of access law. So that's why the Bible says, guard your heart. As a matter of fact, the Bible says in, 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 in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, guard your heart, for out of it flows the wellspring of life. In other words, the person that gets your heart gets your life. The person that controls your heart, the person that influences your heart, the person that can manipulate your heart, he gets everything. He gets the friends you choose, the places you go, the choice you make for work, how you spend your money, how you walk, talk, act, breathe, smell. He gets everything. So guard your heart. Because out of it flows the wellspring of life. Now, I'm going to tell you, if we're living in a culture today that's anything, it is not a heart-guarding culture. I remember when I was in seminary, I lived with, I lived with gosh, it was five of us, six of us in, a, in an apartment. We, got, we had a three-bedroom apartment, two guys to a room. We split the rent, and the more you jammed in there, the cheaper the rent was. If I could spell anything when I was going to seminary, it was P-O-O-R, I was poor. And I remember one night we were in the apartment and I was studying, I was the last one awake. And we, it was a weird apartment too, Mike, it was on three levels. It wasn't a big, it was only like 800 square feet, but it, was on, it had three floors. You, you walked in the door, there's like a den, kitchen area, then there was two bedrooms down here on this bottom level. And then up top, there was one bedroom up some stairs by itself, kind of a loft bedroom. And I slept down at one of the rooms in the bottom, and, and it was late at night, and I was studying, and I was about to go to bed, and I heard the pitter-patter of raindrops on the window. And I remembered, oh, I left the window down in my car. It's getting wet in my car. So I'm going to go roll up the window. So I went, all the guys were sleeping, I could hear them snoring. I went out the door, I shut it behind me, I went around, I rolled up my window, I came back inside. Now I was only gone like a minute and a half. And during that minute and a half, something happened. All chaos broke out in that apartment. I walked back into the apartment. It was completely different than I had left it. Every roommate I had was out of bed, running around in their boxer shorts with, with golf clubs and baseball bats, and they were all screaming, somebody's in the house, somebody's in the house, somebody's in the house. I'm thinking, how could somebody have gotten in the house? And it starts to dawn on me what had happened. They were asleep in their beds, sugar plums dancing in their heads. I went out the door to roll up my window. All they know is they heard a door shut. The first thought that popped in their pea brains is somebody just broke in. They now grabbed the nearest weapons that they could find to protect the belongings that we did not even have, like nine irons and baseball bats. And they're running around in the dark, refusing to turn on lights, about to kill each other, looking for somebody that was not there. I was about to bust a gut. <laughs> I knew what was going on. They knew none of what was going on. They're looking at me, and they're like, Scott, what's your problem? I said, I ain't got no problem. I'm having the time of my life. They're saying, man, don't you know, hey, where's your weapon? Weapon. <laughs> I don't need no weapon except to protect myself from you. They say, what are you talking about? I said, guys, I just went outside to roll up the windows of my car. It's raining outside. I was the last one awake. They looked at me, and they said, you just went outside? I said, yes. When? Just now? Yes, guys, just now. They say, well, when you went out, did you see somebody come in? <laughs> Have you ever seen something dawn on five people at one time? It's like this invisible wet blanket just kind of goes, whew, silence. They looked at each other. They began to lay down their weapons. Finally, one of them broke the embarrassed silence and said, uh, fellas, we ain't going to tell nobody about this, are we? I thought, I'm going to tell every church I ever preach in front of for the rest of my career. Embarrassment. Embarrassment. And then embarrassment gave way to honesty. One of them said, we so stupid. And then the honesty gave way to pride. The philosopher among us, that guy, you know that guy, right? If you don't know that guy, you are that guy. <laughs> he began to reason within himself and then he spoke out loud. Kind of like Peter in the Bible, knowing not what to say, he said. And he said, fellas, we have no reason to be embarrassed about this event this evening. Nor do we have reason 
to make fun. We have learned a Bible lesson that should promptly allow us to sleep soundly in our beds every night. We've learned that, bless God, nobody, but nobody will ever successfully break into our apartment and steal our possessions or they will die death by nine iron. I mean, that was kind of how he had it all worked out. But you know what? With passion, we guarded. It looked like foolishness. Somebody stand up in there and say, these guys have lost their mind. And many times when you say, wait a minute, I belong to Jesus. I don't just watch any old kind of movie. I belong to Jesus. I don't just surf on any kind of internet website. I belong to Jesus. I don't just let, what, 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 listen to any kind of music and let it in my head. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And my standard is the word of God. And I love Jesus. And I want to accurately reflect the glory of God. And the God I serve is holy. The God I serve is righteous. The God I serve is untainted by this world and I am his spotless bride, when you begin to guard your heart, the world will say you're foolish. The world will say you're out of your mind. But God says, be proud, be honored, understand you're doing what if you do. You are guarding your heart. Guard your heart. Hey, listen, girls, don't just date any old body. Listen, guys, don't just date any old body. Hey, don't just marry just any old body. Don't just believe just any old thing. Don't just watch just any old thing. Sanctify your eyes. Sanctify your ears. Sanctify your mouth. Sanctify your body. Sanctify your mind. Sanctify, consecrated unto God. Why? Because you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Guard your heart. So we can assume from the one verse that says, with my whole heart I've sought you, that he had found God and he's guarding his heart because he said, with my whole heart. And because God had said, if you seek me with your whole heart, you'll find me. And because David said, I've sought you with my whole heart, he had hold of God. He had hold of the most precious one in this universe. He had hold, he was having communion with this maker, the creator, the one who sent his only son to die. He had God by the hem of that garment. And I'm telling you, he wasn't going to let go. And that is why he wrote the last line of verse 10. Oh, let me not wander. Oh, let me not stray. Oh, let me not drift. Lord, I got you now. I'm holding on. But let me not wander. Now, why would he ask God? Why would he pray that? Let me not wander. Here's why, church. Listen, because it's our tendency to wander. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy throne above. Prone to stray. It is our tendency to drift like a boat loosely tied to the dock, which is why it needs to be tied to the dock. It's not tending to drift toward the dock, but away from the dock. It's our tendency to drift. Now, how does God answer this prayer? And God will answer a prayer like that. Let me not wander. How, how does God answer that prayer? Here's how he answers it. You'll be in a service like this. Maybe in a worship service like that. Maybe even a quiet time. Maybe a Sunday school class, a Bible study. Maybe just listening to a preacher on a podcast or the radio. And God will bring something up. You ever had God bring something up? God will bring something up. Something that has compromised your holiness. Something that is compromising your integrity, compromising your righteousness. He'll bring something up. Now, as soon as God brings something up, now we call that conviction. As soon as God brings conviction in by the Holy Spirit, Satan is right there waiting to put his spin on it. And here's what Satan says about conviction. Satan says that feeling that you're feeling when you're convicted, that is an angry God beating you over the head with a celestial club because you blew it again. Let me tell you, that is a lie from the pit of Satan. Conviction is not an angry God beating you up because you blew it again. Conviction is a loving God wooing a straying heart back to himself. And he's bringing up the thing that breaks fellowship because what God wants is your fellowship back. So he can restore the glory in your life. Oh, let me not wonder. 
Let me not stray. Now, I'm going to tell you something, friend. I'm telling you, we, I, my, my great fear in our generation is that we have so said no to the conviction of the Lord so many times that we don't even feel it anymore. We got guys at the top of the SBC chain in our convention falling to immorality. Just came out last week. We, we, we got pastors in this very town that used to pastor, and now they don't pastor anywhere. They're share, selling insurance, a car somewhere, because they were disqualified from ministry. Do you know why? Because they said yes to sin and no to God. They said no, no, no to the Holy Spirit. Chain of nudges from God that led all the way up to the exposure of the sin itself. Friend, I'm telling you, you can't, listen to me, you can get a hard heart toward Jesus. You can numb your conscience. Satan loves a numb conscience because that locks God out and opens the door to him and nobody can shut. And I'm going to tell you something, friend, while there's conviction, thank God for it. While you feel messed up because you sinned, thank God for it because God is dealing with the thing that he's got to surgically remove so he can restore the fellowship to restore the glory in your life. Thank God for conviction. I believe we are living in the last days. I believe we are living in the last days. I know not everybody believes that. I had a guy walk up to me after an eschatology sermon I preached, and he said, Brother Scott, do you really believe that, what you just preached? Do you really believe these are the end times? Do you really believe these are the last days? I was like, Brother, how old are you? He said, 92. I said, Brother, you're in the last days. I'm just saying, there's, there's people. <laughs> but the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, and that could be any time, the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, he is coming back, hear me, for a spotless bride. A spotless bride. Not a cigar sucking, card playing, life gambling, adulterating bride. He's coming back for a spotless bride. We are the bride of Christ. So if he's coming back for a spotless bride, the difference between where we are now and where he's going to pick us up then, there's a whole lot of conviction and turning and revival that needs to happen. Because we are a, merit, we are a church that is strayed from God. We've said yes to where Jesus said no. We have condoned what God does not sanction. We are turned on by what, by what turns him off. Friend, we need Conviction. I've been to a lot of weddings, and I love doing weddings. I haven't done many weddings. I, I was never a pastor. I was always an evangelist. But some of my friends, when they got married, said, Scott, will you do the wedding? And I did several of them, and that's a great thing. I enjoy doing that. I mean, you kind of got a bird's eye view. You know, you're sitting up there at the front of the place uh, in your spot as a preacher. You got all the groomsmen out there in the tuxes that they rented for the weekend, and you got all the bridesmaids over here who had to pay for their dresses, and they're really mad at the bride because they'll never be able to sell that dress on eBay and much less go to another wedding where they're going to wear that again, and it cost over $200. This is stupid. And so, so they're up there waiting, and, and so the mamas are there, and the family's there, and everybody's grinning and smiling and looking at each other awkwardly, waiting. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? The groom's nervous. He's standing up there looking at his watch. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting? We're waiting for the dun 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 dun. dun from the, we're waiting for the entrance of the bride. And the church stands, and they look at the back. And here she comes, decked out, white dress, makeup, every hair where it ought to be. You're sitting there looking, you're thinking, she don't look nothing like she looked yesterday. <laughs> now, I've never seen an ugly bride. I've been in a lot of weddings. I've never seen an ugly bride. I've had some close calls. But, but I've never seen <laughs> an ugly bride. I mean, I've been in all kinds of weddings. I've, I've, I've talked to all kinds of young people, but I'm going to tell you something. I, those weddings, I tell you, there was something different about the weddings where, where, where they had, where, where they, listen to me, where they had maintained their purity. It's something about those weddings where they were the first ones to marry each other. They'd never been married before. And some of them even had messed up years ago in their past sexually. But in that relationship, saving themselves for this day, they, they, they maintained their purity. And the thing that I noticed that those weddings had in common that the other weddings did not is that when that bride was coming down that aisle, she could look her groom in the eye. 
She had a clear conscience. Wasn't easy, but we waited. It was hard, but we waited. We were tempted, but we were unspotted, save for this day. Friend, I'm telling you, Jesus is the groom. We, his church, are the bride. And he's not coming back for an adulterous bride. He's not coming back for an impure bride. Revelation 12 says he's coming back for a spotless bride, one that when he takes her, she'll be able to look him in the eye. The Bible says, unspotted by the world. Which means, folks, we got to take God's grace and bathe in it. We got to take God's mercy that is so rich and free and say, thank you, Jesus, and use it. We got to take the conviction of God that bothers our flesh but soothes our soul and say, thank you, Lord, you're wooing me home. I am coming just as I am. And it's always good to know there's as much mercy and grace available today as the day we got saved. You say, Scott, I'm doing okay. What if you came to my house in Sugar Hill, Georgia? You sat down and you fellowship with my family and I say, would you like something to eat? I don't know. What do you got? Well, let me look. I'll, I'll be right back. Hey, I don't have much in the fridge right now, but I got two dozen eggs. How about me making us a big old omelet? One for me, one for your whole family, one for my whole family. We'll just, just, I'll just crack all the eggs. We'll, I'll make, that's fine. That's fine. So I say, you just hang out with my wife, you and your family. I'll be right back with our omelets. And I go into the kitchen and I get out a dozen eggs and I get out a big old mixing bowl and I just start cracking eggs. And on egg number 12 out of that dozen, I go, that one's rotten. And it's already in that bowl. There's 11 good eggs in there. And you find out later that I served you an omelet with 11 good eggs and one bad one. Would you ever eat one of my omelets again? And we wonder why God doesn't use us. We wonder why God doesn't bless us. You wonder why we don't feel empowered like previous generations. You wonder why we're backing down instead of going forward in God. You wonder why we struggle and our marriages have the same statistics and our kids have the same statistics and our addictions have the same statistics inside the churches, outside the church when we've been giving God for years an 11 good egg omelet and one bad egg and we say he ought to just take it like it is. That's all he's worthy of. We make excuses. Well, everybody's got weakness. Well, nobody's perfect yet. Well, everybody's got a vice. Well, you know, nobody's perfect. We're forgiven. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Listen, man, for liberty in Jesus is not licensed to be impure in any area of our life. And God deserves all 12 eggs right. Amen. And God will do something no chef can do. When you realize that there's a compromise, when you realize that there's a place of, 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 that's been yielded to the enemy, when you realize that there's a stain in your life, when you realize that you've cordoned off a piece of your life and in unrighteousness has invaded there and impurity has invaded there and unholiness has invaded there, when you bring that to God, God does something no chef can do on food television network. God can take an impure omelet and make it pure. God can take what is unclean and make it clean. God can take what is tainted and compromised and make it holy again. God can restore the glory where the glory has faded. He can get the mud off the mirror. He can get the dirt off the glass if the mirror is willing to come and say cleanse me Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Go ahead if you're going to praise him. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Look, look, look. The message today is, is this. Folks, listen. We can maintain purity in an impure world. We can reflect the glory of God in a world that seeks to glorify God. We can walk righteous in a world that antagonizes righteousness. We can do that in our marriage. We can do that in our entertainment life. We can do that in our words and conversations. We can do that in our thought life. We can do that. We can do that. How do we know? Because the question has been asked and the question has been answered. Can a young man keep his way pure? Yes, he can. By taking heed according to the word of God and by seeking God with your whole heart and asking he not let us drift. That is the word of God, our standard, and the God of the word, our passion. 
God can do that. Remember the day you got saved? Remember what you had to bring to God when you got saved? Now, I know some of you grew up in church, got saved young. Praise God for that. But for those of us that had strayed a long way, we'd run far and hard. Do you remember what you had to bring to God? Do you remember how readily He forgave you of all that? Instant. Let us not forget He's the same God today. Let us not forget He's the same Jesus. Let us not today that grace is still just that abundant and mercy is still just that free. And if we come to Him and say, Lord, I'm not what I ought to be, but praise God, you can make me what I ought to be. I'm not what I'm going to be, but Lord, you can take me to where I'm going to be. Lord, I'm not, I, I, I've known better and I've, I, I've done wrong, but Lord, today I come and I just want to be at the next level. I just want to be at the next level. And listen, and if you come to the altar this morning and you pray, this is not some admission that you're, you know, some, you're addicted to some heinous sin. If you're coming to the altar today, here's why. This is the prayer. Lord, I'm here and I want to be here. Lord, I'm here and I want to be here. Lord, I'm here and I want to be here. Lord, I'm here and I want to be here. Whatever the next level is for you in reflecting the glory of God in every area of your life that's the prayer will there be confession in that probably will there be repentance in that certainly will there be conviction of course but at the end of the day it's not about I've done all these things wrong it's about Lord at the end of the day it's about your glory in my life and I want more glory in my life than I got right now for Jesus I want to be more pure I want to be more holy I want to be more consecrated I want to be more sanctified I want to be more like Jesus not less like Jesus and you come and you ask that of God you cry out that to God you seek God for that and I'm telling you he will bless you in that wouldn't it be great if people said you know what can we go to lunch? Can you tell me what's different about your life? Because I see it. Wouldn't it be great if somebody texted you one day and said, hey, I want to get together. I want to talk because you're, you're different. You don't only talk about God. I can see God in you. Your marriage is different. Your kids are different. Your attitude is different. Your reactions are different. Your response is different. And you'll be able to say, because I'm not preoccupied with myself and my kingdom, I'm preoccupied with how I represent the Jesus that saved me. God's putting a glory in my life that I can't generate on my own. Let me tell you about that. Folks, God left us here for a reason. To make God look good down here. Satan's attack on you is not an attack on you. Satan's attack on you is an attack on the glory that you represent. That you're to carry in this earth. But God's given us a standard and God's given us himself. And those are the keys to maintain holiness in an unholy world. Is there hope in the house? Is there victory in the house? Are we overcomers in the house? Spotless bride. Spotless bride. Father, we love you today. We thank you that we can come to you as the God of second chances. Lord, not only that, but you're the God of the third chance and the fourth chance to infinity. Thank you. God, today we come and we ask for mercy and grace and forgiveness and cleansing, renewal, restoration, and revival. We want to reclaim your standard as our only standard. And we want to wholeheartedly, single-mindedly, one-track-minded fix our heart on you, Lord, undistracted, that we may glorify you in the earth till you call us home. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name.